Okay, we're going to uh, continue with the uh, optimization uh, work. And uh, we're going to look at something called Lagrange multipliers. But before we do that, I want to kind of set the stage by looking at uh, a familiar problem. Uh, let's suppose we've got an ellipse. Uh, and what we want to do is, and, I, and I'm just going to focus on quadrant one. I want to know what is the biggest rectangle that I can fit inside this quadrant one uh, so that the, it, it's constrained by the ellipse, the curve in quadrant one. That's what I want to do. I want to find out what the biggest ellipse is, or the biggest uh, rectangle. In other words, the, the rectangle with the largest area. I want to find an X and a Y that will give me that area, and then I want to find out what the area is. Now, when we were in Cal 1, we, of course, said, well, I, I need to just identify that I recognize that the area here is going to be X times Y, right? Well, the problem is I don't know what uh, Y is. In other words, I've got an X, I have to figure out what Y is. Now, this is similar to what we've been doing. I mean, if you think of this as a, as your, your, if you look upon this as, um, a curve. So, so, so maybe we have something like this. Maybe we have g of x, y equals x, y. And what we're doing is we're trying to find a high point on that surface. Okay? So we're trying to find a high point on this surface with this constraint. So what I have to do is I have to figure out, so I'm going to figure out what y equals and then plug in here. And then right back to Cal 1, just differentiate with respect to x and find out what the x is. But anyway, what I want to do is I'm, I'm just going to do this the old-fashioned way, Cal 1, and I'm going to solve this for y, plugging it, plugging it in here, and then I'll differentiate, set it equal to 0, just, to remind, just so that we can be reminded about the process. But what I need to do is I need to solve this one for y. And, of course, I get 1 minus x squared over 16. Okay, so I just brought that over. Now, I'm going to factor out that 1 16th so that I get this. I get y squared over 64 equals 1 16th. And then here I'm going to have 16 minus x squared. All I did was I factored out that 1 16th. Because... What I'm trying to do is make this as neat as possible. Now I'm going to go ahead and multiply both sides by 64. And I get this. I get y squared is equal to 64 over 16. And then I get 16 minus x squared. So I'm doing this preliminary work to make the calculus easier. 64 divided by 16 will be 4. So this is turning out nice. I've got y squared equals 4 times 16 minus x squared. Okay. Now, since I'm only concerned with the first quadrant, I'm going to take the square root to get a y, but I'm not going to do plus or minus. I'm, I'm just interested in positive values for y. So here's what I get. I get that y is equal to 2 times the square root of 16 minus x squared. That's what I get. So what I'm doing is I'm, I'm optimizing along this value for y. You know, y equals 2 times 16, uh, square root of 16 minus x squared. So let me, uh, let me scroll up here and let's see what we've got now. We've got that the area is equal to x times y, which is 2 times the square root of 16 minus x squared. And what I want to do now is differentiate, set it equal to 0. And part of the reason I'm going through this is just to remind us, you know, about the simplifying, how to simplify things. And it's been a while since we've seen something like this. If, um, but now, so, so here's what I want to do. I want to find the derivative with respect to x. And I'm going to take the derivative of the first times the second. Like that. Remember, it's a product. So now I've got to say plus the derivative of the uh, second times the first. Let me just write the 2x in there. Now, the derivative of the second is going to be 1 half times 
16 minus x squared to the negative 1 half times negative 2x. I believe that's got it. And of course, we get some cancellation going on here. Now, here, here's the trick that we can use. Remember, I don't like having these radicals in here. I'm, what I'm going to need to do is set this equal to zero. And what I don't like is the, the, the negative uh, exponents here. I don't like the square root in there. What I'd like to do is simplify it a little bit. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply the top and the bottom by the square root of 16 minus x squared. And when I do that, here's what I get up top. For this first term right here, I'm just going to get 2 times 16 minus x squared. Because when I multiply the square root times itself, the radical goes away. So that's a little trick. Now the good thing comes here because when we multiply 16 minus x squared to the negative 1 half, when I multiply that, times 16 minus x squared to the 1 half, it just is 16 minus x squared to the 0. So that whole thing just becomes 1. And then we've got this, minus 2x squared. And down in the bottom, which we don't care really that much about, it's not going to matter here in just a minute. We get this. Now let me go ahead and see what this turns out to be. This is going to be 32 minus... 4x squared over this denominator. Yeah. Now, I want to set that equal to 0, but really all I need to do is set the top equal to 0. So here's what I'm going to get. I'm going to get 32 minus 4x squared equals 0, and I solve it for x. Okay. So it looks like that's going to give me x squared equals 8, right? And then I square root that, and remember, I'm only concerned about the positive square root, so I get this. I get that the x is equal to the positive square root of 8. So apparently, uh, it looks like we're going to have an optimal value when x is equal to the square root of 8. Now, I need to know what the, what the y is, but so far, that's what we've got. So, so let's go ahead and see if we can figure out what the y is. Now, the y, what was it? It was 2 times... 16 minus x squared. So let me go ahead and plug that in. We, if we put in the square root of 8, we get 2 times square root of 16 minus 8, which is 2 times the square root of 8. Ah, so there you have it. There's your y. Now, unless I made some kind of mistake here, I believe that's it. Now, here's your area then. Your area is x times y. This is going to be the optimal area for your rectangle. And that's going to be area is equal to x, which is the square root of 8, times y, which is 2 square roots of 8. So I believe that's going to be 16. Okay. Any questions about that? Okay, so, so that looks like, so that's just to refresh your memory from Cal 1, this whole idea of optimization. And really, we did this recently, it, it, but we thought of it in terms of surfaces, and we were trying to optimize along a curve, right? So, so we were optimizing along a, you know, a path, uh, along a level curve. Now, what I want to do is uh, introduce this thing called Lagrange multipliers. And really, before I do that, I want to... Uh, I want to kind of help you to see where the whole notion of Lagrange multipliers comes from and the, the idea uh, behind it. <clears throat> let's think of, let's, let's suppose that uh, you are on top of a mountain above it, well above it, looking down. Uh, and what you see is, uh, you've all seen contour maps, right? Where, okay, so maybe this is the top of the mountain here. And wherever you see a, a, cur a line like that, that indicates that's the same elevation, right? So here's an elevation. Here's an elevation. You know, you see these, these different elevations here. And what you're trying to do, and, and you can think of this as a surface with level curves, right? So this is, this is a bunch of level curves. 
And let's suppose that you have a path. And what I want to do is I want to find the highest point on that mountain that's constrained by this path. In other words, I'm constrained by being along the path. Now, if you look at that, you can pretty much tell what the highest point is, right? I mean, it's going to be right here, right? Because you're going up the mountain, you, you get to this level, and then you start going back down the mountain. So it's pretty clear that your highest point occurs whenever your path just touches this level curve right there, right? Okay. Now, if you think about it, though, what you're doing is you're saying, okay, my, the highest point is going to occur whenever this curve here, this, this little path here, and this level curve share a tangent, right? So you can see this level curve and this path, they share a tangent here. Does everybody see that? Now, if they share a tangent, then that means their gradients are parallel at that point, don't they? Because remember, gradients are uh, orthogonal to level curves. They make 90 degrees with the tangent. So what we have here is a situation where you have uh, this, these two curves are tangent to each other, and that means their gradients are going to be parallel. Does everybody see that? And if gradients are parallel, remember there are vectors, that means they're multiples of each other, right? So one vector is a multiple of another. Okay? That's, that's the deal with parallel vectors. Okay, any questions about that? Okay, now let, let's, uh, let's go a little, uh, get a little away from that application and just look at this problem that we just dealt, dealt with. And what we have, uh, we had x squared over 16 plus y squared over 64 equals 1. This is what we had. And what we were trying to do, you, you remember we were working with this thing. We said the area is x, y, and we were trying to optimize the area. And we had a constraint. This right here is our constraint, and this is what we're trying to optimize. So here's what I want to do. I want to identify x, y this way. I just want to name this f of x, y equals x, y. Okay? And that's, you know, that's the area. And I'll change, I'll, I'll name this g of x, y. You know, I'll just name it that way. So it's a way that I can talk about x squared over 16 plus y squared over 64 equals 1. Uh, this, this right here, I can, you know, it's just g of x, y. Now, I want to do this. I want to look at some level curves of um, this thing. In other words, this is what we're trying to optimize. And what I want to do is I want to just look at some level curves. Now, I've got some level curves up here that you can see. I've got a red one, a black one, a pink one, and a green one. And what I want to do is just, just think about, so, so here's what I've got. Let's suppose I have xy equals 1. That's a level curve, right? So we've got this surface up here, xy equals 1. And by the way, let me show you. I've graphed this for us already. Here's really what we're looking at. I mean, if you, if you talk about in three space, three dimensions, we've got our elliptical cylinder here, right, going up. And then you've got this green and that is the uh, z equals xy. See? And what we're trying to do, if you look at this, let's see if I can get it back with the, uh, turn this around. Yeah, here we go. <laughs> okay, so, so there's kind of what we're looking at. We're just looking at the quadrant one, but if you look in here, you'll notice that there is an optimal value right here, right? Okay, that's kind of what we're looking for. So uh, let me go back. Uh, let me go back. And here it's us looking from above. Okay, 
So if you've got this one, you've got xy equals 1 over x. And what I did was I just graphed you know, our xy equals 1. I just graphed that, and that gave us that. I think that's that red one. And I think what I did, though, when I graphed this, I went in powers of 2. Okay? So I said xy equals 2, and that gave me y equals 2 over x. And I believe that was this one right here. And then I did 4, which is this one. And uh, then I did this one. This was like, uh, you know, some unusually, it was a big number. But, but look, think about this. For this first level curve here, this corresponds to a rectangle like this. Okay, it corresponds to that rectangle. And this is when the area is 2, right? So this curve right here corresponds to a rectangle that we can make of area 2. Well, I think, I think what I did was I think this is actually the one I graphed. Okay? So that would be, that would be the, this rectangle right here. Okay. Now, if I, if I go to another one, uh, let's say, uh, well, this next one. Let's suppose I have xy equals 4. Okay. That would correspond to a rectangle like this one. Okay. And that area would be 4. Now, you can see that as I, as I go out, I start off with an area of 2. Then I get an area of 4. Now, this one over here, I think I did something like, uh, I forgot what it was. It was xy equals um, maybe 16 or something like that. No, it was not xy equals 16. It was xy equals um, 32. So this one out here was xy equals 32. Now, you can see that this one is way outside the constraint, right? In other words, just like these corresponded to a little rectangle in here, this one is way outside. But you can also see that as I selected these level curves, like 2, 4, and so forth, the area was getting bigger. And remember, we're trying to find a bigger and bigger area. We're trying to maximize the area. This one's too big. These are getting bigger. But if you think about it, and, and I said, well, which level curve will indicate the largest rectangle? You would say, well, you want it to be as far out here as possible. In fact, this rectangle right here looks like a good one, right? That looks like the rectangle that's going to give you, that looks like the, uh, the uh, level curve that's going to correspond to the largest rectangle. Do you see that? I mean, if the areas are getting bigger and bigger and bigger, here it's too big, this is too small, this looks like the one that would be tangent, right? It's sort of like the, the uh, contours on the mountain, right? Okay. So here's what I want to do. I want to figure out, I want to find the, at this tangent point right there, I want to equate the gradients of the constraint and what I'm trying to optimize. In other words, I have this thing and I have this thing. So here's the way I'm going to approach it. I'm going to take the gradient of f, which is what I'm trying to optimize, and I'm going to set it equal to some constant times the gradient of g. Okay. Because those vectors are parallel. So I'm going to make I'm going to equate those two and then see see where that gets me. So so here I got the gradient of f. Now the gradient of f is going to be, so here, here we go, gradient of f is going to be, what is it going to be, yx, right? The partial with respect to x, that's the first one. Partial with respect to y, that's the second. So it's going to be yx. Any questions about that? Now, let's look at the gradient with, uh, of g. Okay, the gradient of g, let's see here, the partial with respect to x, that's going to be x over 8, isn't it? Right here, 2x over 16, the x over 8. And then what about this one? This would be y over 32. Okay, now 
let's, let's set this up. Now, by the way, this is called a Lagrange multiplier right here, this lambda. Now, so here's the way this is going to work. I'm going to equate these two. And what that's going to look like is this. It's going to be yx equals lambda like that. Okay, any questions? Now, here's what we have to do. We have to equate these. So this is going to give us some equations here. y equals lambda times x over 8. Okay, so we're, we've got a system of equations, what we're going to have. This is going to be x is equal to uh, lambda times y over 32. There's what we have. Okay. Now, here, here's, here's what we're doing. When we set these up, what we also want to do is put down here what, uh, the constraint. So we've got x squared over 16 plus y squared over uh, 64 equals 1. Okay. So really, we have a set of equations. This one, you know, this is equation 1, equation 2, equation 3. Okay. And we want to use these uh, to figure out what the x and the y are. Okay. So here we go. Now, here's the thing about Lagrange multipliers and using this method. What happens is it's easy to get bogged down in the algebra. So each problem sometimes presents its own unique challenge. But let me just show you how I would approach this problem here. What I would do on this one is I would solve this one and this one both for lambda. Because what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to use, I want to get to the point where I can plug into this thing and eliminate one of the variables. So, so dig this. I've got x is equal, I mean lambda is equal to 8y over x. Okay, that's from this first one. From the second one, I've got that lambda also equals 32x over y. Okay, I've got those two things. Any questions about that? Now, if lambda equals 8y over x and lambda also equals 32x over y, I can equate these. See, that's what I'm using lambda for. Okay. Now, here, okay, so here's what I, you might think. Well, that's no, that's no better. Well, let's see now. I Let me just cross multiply here or multiply both sides by xy, okay? If I multiply both sides by xy, what I get is 8y squared equals 32x squared. Okay. Now, let me go ahead and divide by 8 and dig what happens now. I get y squared is equal to 4x squared, don't I? Ah, okay. Now, this is something I can work with because now look, this one here, I've got x, whoops, okay, I've got x squared over 16 plus, instead of, in place of y squared, what I'm going to do is put 4x squared, right, because that's what it equals. Now, I've got a lovely equation that's just in terms of x's, and I can solve those. So here I go. Let, let, let me simplify this a little bit here. I've got x squared over 16 plus x squared over 16. That's nice. Charming. Okay, now let's see what we've got now. I've got 2x squared over 16 equals 1. That means I've got x squared over 8 equals 1. And doesn't this give me that x is equal to the square root of 8? And that's what we knew from before, right? We already knew that would happen. Now, of course, you can go back in and you can, you can solve. I mean, I could now solve for y, but I don't think there's any point. This is the main thing. And this, 
going through this process, we would still find that area is going to be 16. Okay, any questions about that? Everybody see that? Okay, so this is the this is Lagrange, uh, the method of Lagrange multipliers. Now, let's look at this one then. What we want to do, so, so here's the way it's going to be set up. We're going to be given something to optim find the minimum or the max. And we're going to be given a constraint. This is our constraint. Here we have a plane, and here we have this surface up here. And what we want to do is we want to find the, the minimum value of this f constrained to this. So first thing, I'm just going to identify g, x, y, z as 2x minus 3y minus 4z equals 49. Let me just go ahead and name that. Now, I start this process. I'm going to get the gradient of f, the gradient of g, and equate them. So here I go. I've got uh, partial with respect to x. That's 4x equals lambda times uh, 2, 2 lambda. Everybody see that? Just saying partial with respect to f, I mean partial with respect to x, partial with respect to x. Now, let me go to the next one. So here is 2y equals negative 3. Next one, 6z equals negative 4. And then, of course, we got to remember that we've got 2x minus 3y minus 4z equals 49. So what we're trying to do, really, is we're trying to use, we're going to use this equation right here to find values. So right now I've got three variables in one equation. But I've got this stuff up here. Maybe I can use this to eliminate a couple of these variables. If I can get x in terms of, if I can get all the variables in terms of x, you know, x is x, if I can get y in terms of x, z in terms of x, or any of the other variables, then I can just plug in here and solve it. Okay, so let's see what happens here now. Uh, here on this one, we've got lambda is equal to 2x. Okay. And this one, we've got lambda is equal to uh, negative uh, two-thirds y. That's what we've got so far. Let me go ahead and solve this z one. Lambda is equal to uh, negative three halves z, right? Any questions? Okay. So, here we go. So, 2x equals negative 2 thirds y. And I think what I'll do, um, I think I'll solve for y. Okay. So, let me solve for y here, and I get that y is equal to, is it going to be negative 3? Ah, negative 3. Uh, x, x, of course, yeah. So every place I have a y, I can put a negative 3x. Okay. And I'll just let x be itself. Now, let me figure out what z is in terms of x. Okay, So here I've got negative 3 halves z is equal to 2x. That means that z is equal to negative four-thirds z, I mean x, yeah. Is that right? Okay, everything is in terms of x now. So, let, let's see what we've got here. Looks like, I'm, you know, I'm feeling real positive about this problem now. So we've got 2x minus 3, and let's see here, y is negative 3x. That's good minus 4, let me see, negative 4 thirds x, and that equals 49. So all I did was I just plugged in everything. Now did I make any mistake there, do you see? 
I think everything looks good. It's a go then. It's on. So let, let's just see what we have now. This is, uh, you know, we can solve an equation like this. That's like preschool, right? So we've got 2x plus 9x. Watch, well, now I'll mess up because <laughs> I, I ridiculed this equation. And this is going to be 16 thirds x equals 49. Okay. Now, let's, let's uh, break this down further. I think what I want to do is go ahead and uh, add these together. So I have 11x plus 16 thirds x equals 49. And I don't like that fraction there, so let me just multiply through by 3. And I get 33x plus 16x is equal to 3 times 49. Is that like 147? I mean, uh, 137. No, 127. No, 147. I had it right the first time. Ah, yeah, 147. Trust your first instinct. Okay, now let's see what we've got here. Uh, 33 and 16, what is that going to be? That's 43. Four, ah, 49x equals 3 times 49. It looks like x might be 3. Ah, excellent, excellent. That's the kind of thing we like to see happen. Okay, uh, it, it encourages us that we're doing everything correctly. Now, okay, so x is equal to 3. Now, y is equal to negative 3 times x, right? Is that what we said? Let's go back up and check it. Yeah, y, here it is. y is equal to negative 3x. Now, z is negative 4 thirds x. Ah, okay. So z is equal to negative 4 thirds times 3, which is negative 4. So it looks like our minimum occurs when x is 3, when y is negative 9, and when z is negative 4. Now, we could, I, I won't do it here, but of course we can go back and plug those values in, into the original, because remember, this is what we would plug it into right here, this, this one. Okay, any questions about that? 